So thank the organizers for uh, the opportunity to speak here. It's a real honor, and I think the program has been uh, fantastic <coughs> so far. So yes, uh, we work with bacteria, and we are the first uh, uh, problem that we wanted to study as physicists in, uh, in cells, not only bacteria, but in cells, is understanding the phenotypic viability of cells, not the genetic viability, but the phenotypic viability. And eventually, this interest led us to to, to tackle uh, uh, evolution problem in general and antibiotic uh, resistance in particular. So the phenotypic viability that we played uh, with as physicists as a mathematical game, at the end of the day, I hope to show you that it turns out to be a very relevant and clinically relevant problem. So uh, why do, what do I mean by phenotypic viability? So here is an example. So this is a population of E. coli just taken from a stationary phase and plated on fresh medium and they start growing, okay? That's the easiest experiment you can do. You, you can see that bacteria grow, but you can see that some of them grow much at, a much low, uh, at a much later time. Run it again. So some of them will start growing immediately. Some of them will sit there, like this one and this one, but eventually they'll grow and once they grow, they'll grow at the same rate as the other bacteria, right? But for some reason, these bacteria are growth arrested for a certain period of time, and, uh, b and they will grow, and this is not genetic viability. So these bacteria are uh, genetically identical. They all came from the same clone. So uh, why is it interesting? Uh, it's interesting but because at the end of the day, this variability is influencing the outcome of the whole population. Not always. Typically, if you take these uh, bacteria and, uh, and grow them, the fast-growing bacteria will dominate the population, and you have these non-growing bacteria that are going to be a very small minority, and in most assays, they are not going to, to do any difference. But when do they make a difference? Under antibiotics. And why? <coughs> because antibiotics are targeting much more effectively actively growing cells. Okay, most antibiotics are targeting actively growing cells much more efficiently, and when bacteria are this, in this transiently non-growing state, they are more resilient to antibiotics. Now, you can see it very easily, and it was actually seen a long time ago by a medical doctor called Bigger. Uh, uh, and wh what, what you can see if you do a kill curve, so you start with a population of bacteria at t equals zero, you expose them to antibiotics. If the population was completely uniform, you would expect a simple exponential decay. A simple exponential decay means that each bacteria has the same probability to die. And this is what you see if you do the experiment for, the, for, 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 the, uh, for a few hours. This is what you see. You see an exponential decay. But if you wait long enough and continue measuring survival, you see that the initial exponential decay leads to a much slower decay. And these bacteria are killed much slower, but they are not resistant. So it's not a genetic... <coughs> Mutation, if you take bacteria from here, isolate them, and regrow the whole population again, you get again the same curve. Okay? So when Bigger saw this effect, so what he saw, not doing the whole curve, but what he saw is that bacteria isolated after a day of antibiotics, when you regrow them, they are as sensi uh, sensitive as, as initially. Um, uh, this phenomenon was quite ignored. And uh, it was ignored because I think that most of the community thought that it was an artifact of some aggregates of cells in the medium that were not exposed to the same antibiotic concentration or on the cell wall. And, uh, and eventually what, what uh, nailed down this problem uh, completely, the explanation for this double exponential uh, decay, came from direct observation under the microscope in a microfluidic device. So this is the same experiment as I showed you before. E. coli taken from a stationary phase, put in microfluidics. Here they can grow on, on they are uh, forced to grow on lines, and they are com continuously washed with medium or antibiotic eventually. So you, you start by just allowing them to grow, and they grow on these lines, okay? And now we can expose them to antibiotics. And this is what antibiotics do. They wipe off the bacterial population. This is a penicillin-like uh, antibiotic. And after a while, you wash away the antibiotic to see 
what bacteria have survived. And what you see is that this bacterium, for example, managed to survive the antibiotic uh, uh, exposure that was many hours there. And when it, but it, when, when it, it, uh, the antibiotic is not there, it grows as, as fast as the bacteria at the beginning. And if you look at the beginning of the movie at the location where this surviving bacteria was, it's here. <coughs> This bacterium was here. It's very faint. You can hardly see it. So it's a, a different metabolic state, okay? And uh, and it was dormant for the whole duration of the of the antibiotic treatment, and therefore managed to survive the antibiotic, and grew when the antibiotic was not around anymore, okay? So this is what is called bacterial persistence, and here you can sh we, you can see that at least in this case it's directly linked to the fact that some bacteria are not growing transiently, and if they are lucky enough to be non-growing for the duration of the antibiotic treatment, they will survive. So this phenotypic viability of growth can be studied at different growth stage of the bacteria. So you may find it at exponential phase or also there. It's the lowest phenotypic viability. So when you really grow at least E. coli, <laughs> this is what I, I, I can assure you because we really look at them under the microscope, at the exponential phase, these non-growing states are almost inexistent, but the phenotypic variability of growth is very apparent during the lag phase. And what is the lag phase? The lag phase means that you take bacteria from stationary phase, you expose them to fresh medium, and then it will take them some time to grow again. Uh, this curve was defined by, by Monod, who really took the care to define each of, of these stages very precisely. And what he already realized is that this lag phase, this time is dominated by the bacteria that are growing fast. So if you have dormant bacteria there, yes or no, you will hardly see them on the population measurement. Now, of course, if you look at uh, the microbiology, most since the work of Mono, 99.9% .9 of the work is done at exponential phase. So the lag phase, for example, is hardly studied. And we bumped into this problem of the lag phase just because we realize that bacteria that we're taking from a stationary phase, which is a typical way to do experiment, exposed to fresh medium and then exposed during some time here to antibiotics, actually some of the bacteria at the lag phase remain dormant even for days. And these very few bacteria are the ones that are going to survive the antibiotic treatment. And therefore, for antibiotics, they are crucially important. So now you want to quantify this lag phase. So if I show you again this movie I showed you before, so you have bacteria that exit the lag phase very quickly, and other bacteria, they stay dormant for a longer time, but eventually they'll exit the lag phase and grow as fast. And you, when you quantify this particular example, you see that sometimes this quantification can really lead to a bimodal phenotype of lag phase. These bacteria are going to dominate, these are the only uh, early one, they exit the lag phase very soon, takes about an hour for E. coli in typical condition. But here, you don't see it, but it's a log scale. These ones exit the lag phase with a mean of 10 hours, okay? And some of them will take even more than a day to exit. So is it just an artifact of, of uh, the lab condition of growing cells? Is the lag phase important uh, for bacterial physiology in general? And I think the answer is, is that surely it is. Bacteria in nature are never, I mean, are very rarely for a long period of time at the exponential growth state, right? This exponential growing uh, state or balanced growth that it's called is very nice to study because we are at steady state. For us physicists, it's really nice to be at steady state because there are many things we can say that, but bacteria are rarely at steady state. So if you look at bacteria in the biofilm, they are exponential at the beginning. Very quickly, they make disaggregate because they start exhausting nutrients. And then they make a biofilm. Eventually, this biofilm is mostly non-growing. Some of the cell will exit and start their, their cycle again by having a very long lag phase. Now, is it restricted to bacteria? No, because also in cancer cells, for example, yes, in a tumor, it's very clear that the growth is exponential for a while, but inside the tumor, the condition change. There is epoxia, there are all, all kinds of conditions that make the tumor grow 
less efficiently, and certainly some of the cells stop growing, despite the fact that cancer is. But when you remove a lesion, or the, the, there is a, a, a phenomenon called repopulation that actually exposed the cancer cells to fresh medium. Therefore, they are in the lag phase, right? How long can they stay non-growing in this lag phase is, of course, uh, not uh, studied uh, uh, much. So uh, remaining dormant in the lag phase protects bacteria from antibiotics. And what we can do is mark, have a marker for bacteria that are non-growing. And this is a red marker here. And when they start growing, they're going to turn on green. OK, and then you can see that they are just growing in fresh medium here. Now we're going to put the antibiotics. And you can see that, as expected from this kind of antibiotics, Antibiotics are targeting much more efficiently actively growing cells, so the green cells are gone. The red cells were able to survive, but eventually these red cells will wake up and recreate this growing population. Okay, so they are not resistant. This is called persistence or tolerant, and this tolerance is characterized by the fact that they can survive the time of treatment, and they are not very sensitive to the concentration of the treatment. Similarly, uh, we recently shown that using a very similar approach that you can put mammalian cells also in this microfluidic device and look at them dividing and mark them for the non-growing uh, cells. And it's not going to be surprising for you that most of uh, many anti-cancer treatments are targeting uh, a growing cell more actively. And therefore, uh, mammalian cells, that cancer cells that are at this lag phase are going to assist under anti-cancer treatment much more efficiently. So this kind of tr strategy of being phenotypic viable for microorganism has, has been modeled as bet hedging strategy. So, and, and the idea of these models is to really uh, understand it as an evolutionary tr strategy of diversification. So if you have a uniform population of very fast growing bacteria, and this is what bacteria want to do. They want to grow very fast, uh, usually. Then if uh, uh, a stress, antibiotics is one of them, but not only. Actively growing cells are exposed to many different stresses. Then the population may be wiped off. Now, if you have this phenotypic viability, then eventually you'll have these rare cells that are not growing. And in, they have a fitness course because they don't grow when there is plenty of food around. But in the event of bad condition, they are the ones that are going to survive have this lag phase and ev eventually recreate the whole population. So, okay. yes? Question? Once the cell is dividing, it's not in a dormant state anymore. It's no. genetically identical to the ones before, and still it is resi more resistant to the drug? So, the, so, yeah, so the bacteria are able to persist under the drug only as long as they are at the lag phase. Once they start growing again, they become as sensitive as uh, the whole population. Does it relate to biofilm? Because say, in the lag phase, they have a larger amount of biofilm, <laughs> the lag phase is longer, or there's no relation? No, there is. So, in principle, uh, of course, there are many factors that can affect this lag phase. The, the, the mean of the lag phase, but also the whole distribution of the lag phase. And the more you starve bacteria, the longer the lag phase is. This is, for example, one trivial uh, uh, example of environmental condition that can affect the lag phase. But in this distribution that you showed, it's, uh, By model. Oh, okay. So we'll, we'll, no. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to that, yes. Is this true for all antibiotics? Okay, so m most of the antibiotics require an active process in cells in order to, to, to be able to kill them. So all the beta-lactams, for example, that beta-lactams are antibiotics such as penicillin that target the cell wall. So just to, you know, just, just an example to, to understand why, how it works, so <clears throat> how penicillin works. So the cell is, uh, the, the cell uh, um, uh, wall is, is actually a cross-linked um, molecule, right? It's like a, something that really, a, a rigid skeleton that is around the cell, the bacteria. Now the bacteria, in order to grow, they have to cut some of these bonds in order to, to put some more stuff and grow. So when they cut bonds in their, uh, in their peptidoglycan uh, uh, 
um, uh, wall, then penicillin comes and prevents the rebinding of this bond. Okay? So that's the easy way to describe it. Now, if the cell is not growing and not actively breaking this bond, then penicillin doesn't do anything. Okay? And then if the cell is not growing, not breaking this, this bond, and the antibiotic is around, nothing will happen. You can, you can crank up the antibiotic concentration by a factor of 10. They will still be persistent to this antibiotic as long as they are not growing. Also, antibiotics that target DNA replication have the same type of, uh, of uh, tolerant mechanism. So um, one of, uh, one of uh, the ideas is that these non-growing bacteria are, have actually evolved under many stresses. For example, phages, they are also most, more pro protected from, uh, from some certain type of phages, uh, or heat, or uh, stressful uh, uh, chemical compounds. And, and, and it's very appealing to think of it as an evolutionary process, right? But when we see it, we cannot distinguish whether these bacteria that do not grow are just the byproduct of a defective cell cycle, or really evolution has selected a mechanism to create viability, and this viability enables the population to survive. So uh, th this was a, a question that was open for quite, quite some time. Can really uh, uh, an evolution process create viability in, uh, in a phenotype, and can we really prove that this viability is an adaptive process? So the first thing that we wanted to do is really be able to measure the whole lifetime distribution because we are not talking about the mean, we are talking about the, the whole distribution. And the histogram, for example, that I showed you before that was by model, actually was, um, um, was uh, done with, with a setup that we developed so that even undergrads in our lab can measure uh, the lifetime distribution. So it's based on office scanners. So these are scanners that are for documents. And uh, we have uh, uh, 20 of them. And they are com all controlled by a computer. And the computer uh, controls the scanners and uh, acquires images and movies. And it acquires movies of simple Petri dishes. And why? Because I guess most of you have the experience of having plated an E. coli culture on a Petri dish, yes? Okay, <laughs> so when you plate bacteria on a Petri dish at the end of the day and you come back in the morning and look at the colonies, you, you can see sometimes that some of the colonies are smaller. And why they are they smaller? May sometimes you have a mutant that grows slower, but many times it's just because <coughs> of this lag. So if two bacteria landed on the agar at the same time, but one of them had an hour even a longer lag, it, its colony will appear a la an hour later and when you look at them, they're going to have different sizes. So what the system does is just detects the time of appearance of colonies. And this is a proxy for the lag. Not only for the lag, also for the growth rate, but by analyzing the growth dynamics, you can really uh, uh, measure the lactime distribution. So this is, for example, a movie of just Petri dish bacteria. So you can see that on this side, there is a, s a strain that has many delayed bacteria, and they will appear as smaller colonies just because they appeared at a later time. So you can quantify that. And this is uh, an example. You can quantify, look at each colony, when it appeared, and, and, and how it grew. You see that all these colonies, for example, grow at the, with the same dynamics. And, uh, and, uh, and they grow like that because the main uh, property that dominates that lactam distribution is, is this, uh, this tail of very slowly appearing uh, colonies. OK, I think I need to. <coughs> so back to our question, can we really evolve a lactam distribution? Is it really something that, that can, can happen uh, in the wild? And, and uh, um, the, the, the way to do it, as we know that lagging bacteria have an advantage under antibiotic treatment, is just to put them under antibiotic treatment and, and see whether we can evolve that. But of course, under antibiotic treatment, a different strategy could e evolve, for example, resistance, right? So you all heard about resistance, which is different from what I showed you before in several ways. So resistance is usually due to mutation, right? That renders the whole population more resilient to the drug. And how is it measured in the clinic? 
you put bacteria all over the place on agar, you put a disc with antibiotics in the middle. If you have ever been to the, to, uh, if you ever had an infection, this is a test that was done on the bacteria isolated from uh, your body. So here's antibiotic, it diffuses in the agar and prevent the growth of antibiotic within a certain radius. The larger this inhibition zone, the more sensitive the strain. Okay? And bacteria that are resistant are really able to grow in a higher concentration of antibiotics. So this is how they would look like. Okay? And this resistance is characterized by a number, the MIC, minimum inhibitor concentration. And this is how much antibiotics you need to put, the concentration, in order to prevent the growth of the bacteria. So resistance mechanism, for example, are pumps that take out the antibiotics uh, from the cell. They can be mutation in the target that, uh, that allows the binding of the antibiotic much less efficiently. If you look at all these mechanisms, it boils to having a lower antibiotic concentration in the cell. Okay, so bacteria that are resistant actually are resistant to a certain concentration of the drug. Many of them, if you crank up the concentration much more, they will be killed. But most of them, they just take the uh, uh, effective concentration of the drug uh, uh, to lower numbers. Now, tolerance or persistence, what I told you before, means that strains require much longer time to be killed, right? These dormant bacteria, it doesn't matter what is antibiotic concentration around as long as it's dormant. But it, what matters is that the duration of the treatment is long enough to catch these bacteria as soon as it wakes up. And therefore, with the standard MIC tests that are done in the clinic, you won't see any difference between uh, a, a tolerant strain and uh, a, a, a strain that has, not, uh, that has no dormant bacteria in it. So what, uh, so what we wanted to know is what is going to evolve first. Is it a resistant strain that is going to, occur to, to, to uh, appear in our protocol? Or are we going to change the lactone distribution? So we did the simplest experiment you can, you can imagine. You grow a culture overnight. You expose it to antibiotic. In, uh, you, you dilute it into fresh medium with antibiotics for a certain period of time. Let the antibiotic uh, uh, act. Wash the antibiotic away and let the bacteria grow again. OK? Is it clear? Please do ask me questions uh, if something is unclear. So, what we saw is that within about 8 to 10 cycles, that's all, 8 to 10 exposure to antibiotic, the bacterial population was hardly dying. So if it was killed by five orders of magnitude during the initial treatment, after a few cycles, it was hardly killed, only by an order of magnitude or half of an order of magnitude. So uh, it's... One cycle, it depends how much they, they die. So it's less and less generation, but it's around uh, 20 generations. So it's, it's really fast. So the stress is very strong. So the adaptation is, is, uh, is very strong. So if you do this, the, the, the usual resistance uh, test for the ancestral strain or the evolved strain, you can see that the zone here is no smaller than what you started. With. So it's not resistance that enables them to survive the treatment. Uh, so they have the same MIC if you really measure this uh, quantitatively. And to cut a long story short, what changed in the evolved population, and it changed because they acquired mutation. Okay, so there was a mutation that changed the lag time. And you can see this is just equally plated and just the growth. So you can see that after three hours, they've already undergone several divisions, all of them. But the evolved strain takes much longer for them to wake up from stationary phase. And if you measure the lactam distribution the way I told you that we did, so this is the ancestral lactam distribution, which is quite narrow and with, with a tail here. The evolved lactam distribution is much broader and has shifted to l longer duration. Okay, so now by just, and in most cases, it's just one or two mutations. By one of two mutations, we, the bacteria were able to change quite dramatically the lactam distribution and be able to survive the antibiotic treatment. Yeah. What happens when you remove this bacteria without treatment? So, so th this is... Th 
So th this lifetime distribution was measured without antibiotics, right? So they, they just have this lifetime distribution independently of the antibiotic treatment, okay? And now in terms, that's a, in terms of their fitness, so this is a fitness cost if there is no antibiotics, right? Because they grow slower. So they have a small delay in growth, and therefore they have a small fitness cost by having this, this, this broader and also slightly uh, shifted uh, lifetime distribution. Okay? Yes? How could it be that in an enrichment cycle uh, you had uh, the longer lag uh, time but didn't see any, like you said, the resistance if the mutation rate is the same? Okay, so the mutation rate for resistance and for tolerance, yes. if it's the same. Very good question. So if the resistance rate for resistant to tolerance was the same, we would expect resistance to occur because resistance is an even better strategy than tolerance, right? Because with resistance, you don't have to delay your growth. So when, when there is fresh medium around you grow, and, and you are, you are even able to grow sometimes in presence of antibiotics, right? So the key parameter here is that the target size for tolerance is much, much bigger than for resistance. There are many, many ways of being tolerant, okay? And, and I'll show the mutation, so, so you'll see that. Sure. Um, did you continue the experiment to see if the resistance antibiotic uh, antibiotic resistance was temporary until you can achieve, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the persistent strategy was temporary until you can achieve resistance? Okay, so that's a fantastic question because this is exactly the second part of the talk, okay? okay? <laughs> Right. So th that's that, uh, yes, you definitely know <laughs> that you if you most of the antibiotic evolution resistance evolution in the lab are done by cranking them up very slowly. So you do 20 generation just a, a little bit uh, um, uh, above the MIC, then you increase a, a little bit more, you increase a little bit more and you can with this type of uh, of uh, strategy of course you will evolve resistance each time and, and, and move to higher and higher resistance. But this is not what happens in the clinic, right? When you take uh, antibiotics, your the antibiotic concentration goes high, uh, sometimes a hundred times above the MIC, okay? And, and then goes down, not as abruptly in our, in our system, but it does go down be below the MIC, and then you take another pill and it goes up again, okay? Okay, so I, definitely in, in, in the clinic, you are not taking gradual dose that each day is uh, more and more. If you don't take it properly, right. That is the case for right. So here it's more, it's more mimicking what happens when you, when you have an antibiotic in IV. This is very interesting. Yeah. In, in IV, if you, if you inject antibiotic, it raises within a few, few minutes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I agree that, you know, that it's, it, it's specific to the fact that we expose the, anti the, the antibiotics to high dose, to the therapeutic dose typically, uh, directly from... Uh, the, the, directly from the beginning, we don't increase it gradually, yes. What, what we saw is that the mean of the new lact of the evolved lifetime distribution, so the, f the first time we did five hours of antibiotic treatment, and what we saw is that, okay, the distribution is much broader and it has a very long tail, but the mean of this lactic distribution was five hours. So, of course... Exactly. Yes, yeah, they have five so hours so on. They wait, they, you, you enrich the populations that wait until you wash and then start to grow. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Is this an evolved uh, tolerant uh, strain if you put another antibiotics like conamycin? Okay, so we'll get to that, yes. So first we, we wanted to know whether this, so first if you take here, for example, we identified a mutation, a specific mutation. If you if you take this mutation away and restore the wild type allele, you get the wild type distribution. So it's really uh, evolution by mutation. But now what we did is to change the duration of the antibiotic treatment. So in parallel, we evolved lines with 
three hours of daily antibiotic treatment, or five hours, or eight hours. Okay? And each time, what we saw is that within, I think it was uh, eight to 11 cycles here as well, the uh, evolved population is hardly killed by the antibiotics, and this is where we stop uh, the experiment. Again, resistance has not evolved in this setup, okay? So they are all as sensitive to the antibiotic as the ancestral strain in terms of resistance or no, no resistance. Also, when they grow, they have the same growth rate. So they have, they, you can already guess they all have a difference in their lifetime, but once they exit the lifetime, they have the same growth rate. And what has changed is the lifetime distribution. So this is the lifetime distribution of the ancestral. This is for a strain that has, was evolved for three hours of daily antibiotic treatment, and his mean is very close to three hours. This is for five hours of antibiotic treatment, and again, the mean is very close to five hours, and this is eight hours, and here the mean is shifted to slightly longer time, it's 10 hours. So we think that this one has not optimized its lag yet, but maybe yes. Now, what about under antibiotics, right, you ask. So now if you take the ancestral strain, and compare its sensitivity to, to a DNA gyrase inhibitor. So we evolved it under a beta lactam that target the cell wall. And now we look at the sensitivity of the strains to DNA gyrase inhibitor, so really two different targets. And here again, you see a much enhanced tolerance of the evolved strain also to this inhibitor. So, and, and this agrees with, with understanding that tolerance is really some physiolog very global physiological uh, state of, of the bacteria, and it has it very pleiotropic effects. So now if you look at this optimization that the bacteria have to do, so having this long time, as, as we said, has a fitness cost when in, during the period where the antibiotic is not there. Okay, so in principle, you would like to have the shortest lag time, but during the antibiotic uh, period, you want to have a long lag, and you can just model uh, uh, a population that has a, a lag, uh, a tau lag, and ask what would be the optimal solution under this uh, regime of antibiotic treatment. And, and as you can see, what you expect from the model is, is al an almost linear dependence of the lag time distribution, uh, the mean lag time on the exposure time of the antibiotics, and the data point follows this trend uh, quite uh, nicely. Sorry? The okay, the capital L is a population of the lagging bacteria, yeah. and this is a population of the growing bacteria. So the growing bacteria are growing with, uh, with some uh, growth rate uh, tau, and they are dying uh, also with some factor. So this alpha depends if you are in the antibiotics or not. And uh, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, growing cells are coming from the lagging population also. So they grow and they come from the lagging population. And the, lag, the lagging population is just decaying with this exponential lag time. But there's no input from growing cells to lagging population? No. The, 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 the lag time, the lag population is created at stationary phase and then it just decays. Okay, so this is just a decay dynamics. Okay, so the assumption here is that the lag time distribution is exponential, which is a very strong assumption. But if you, if you do that, you get that. Now, if you think, you know, without equations, without anything, what would be the really best strategy for bacteria? Actually, you would expect this distribution not to get broader because the surviving bacteria are the ones that are outside the treatment. So if, uh, if you have a lag time that is beyond the duration of the treatment, you are going to survive, right? So. For example, this, uh, the ancestral population, so mo most of them are going to be killed and only this tail is going to survive during the treatment. But you can see that this lagging population, some of the bacteria are killed by the antibiotic treatment, right? Because, because of this very broad distribution. So it's not optimal, right? You would like to move all these bacteria to right after the treatment. It's not optimal also because you have a very long tail here. And therefore, these bacteria are going to wake up at a longer time during the growth phase, and they're going to pay the fitness cost. So if you constrain yourself to an exponential distribution, yes, what they do is optimal. But if you allow the distribution to be whatever you want, the best distribution would be just to shift this very narrow distribution to longer times. And we, we don't see that. So either it's just much easier 
to evolve a longer lifetime by changing both the mean and the variance, somehow they are linked. Or there is really some advantage of having a strategy that spreads your bet at the beginning instead of adapting to a precise value of the antibiotic uh, uh, duration. So, <coughs> so of course, uh, resolving this question is, uh, is difficult, but we wanted to understand what molecular mechanism can, at the end of the day, create such a wide distribution. And maybe by understanding this, this mechanism, we can understand how the mean and the variance of the lactam distribution are linked. So we looked at the mutation that we got from, uh, many, uh, uh, from, uh, from the many evolutionary experiments. As I told you, the extension of the lifetime, each time we could identify the mutation that was responsible for it, correct it for the wild type allele and see that it's gone. And so, as uh, was the remark here, clearly the number of mutations that can lead to tolerance here is very broad. So we find mutation in all kinds of targets. So the target size is big, much bigger than for resistance, where usually resistance to a specific antibiotic is within a few genes, sometimes even just one gene. And uh, uh, so we, we found many genes that were mutated, but what was interesting is that we found some of them that were mutated repeatedly. So, and we focused on those. So one of them is a toxin-antitoxin module called VABBC, and I'll, I'll get to toxin-antitoxin uh, soon. One of them is an essential gene, the methionyl tRNA synthetase. So this is an enzyme that puts a methionine of, on its tRNA. And another metabolic uh, enzyme, PRSA, which is also uh, an essential enzyme. And, uh, and, uh, and fructose uh, bisphosphate. So we were very happy with the first one, right? Because years before that, we've been working on toxin-antitoxin system in the context of, of tolerance. And why? Because the first high persistent mutant that was isolated by the group of uh, Harry Smoyd uh, long ago was actually mutated in the toxin-antitoxin system. So we had studied the, the, really the, the biochemical uh, model of another toxin-antitoxin system very, very down to the molecular mechanism. And it was very useful to use it now to understand how it changes the lifetime distribution. So what are toxin-antitoxin system module? It's a pair of gene that you find in quasi all the bacterial species. Okay, so the, the details of, of each pair can be different, but the main mechanism that one of them is a toxin. So when you express it at high level, it kills a cell or, or, or arrests the cells from growing. And the second one is an antitoxin that prevents the toxic action of the toxin. And what is crucial here is that the binding affinity of the toxin to its antitoxin is very high. So it's almost an irreversible reaction. Now, just uh, so what are these modules doing on the chromosome of many species? For example, in E. coli, you have about 20 of them on the chromosome, just these toxin-antitoxin pairs that are probably acquired via lateral gene transfer. In M. tuberculosis, you have almost 100 of them. And, uh, and at the end of the day, nobody knows what these modules are doing. But what we see is that when they are mutated, they can lead to, to the lifetime distribution that we see. And why? Because the strong binding of the toxin to the antitoxin, if you just write the, the, the simplest biochemical equation that you can write for, for the system and solve them, you can see that what you expect for the free toxin versus the total toxin expression is a very nonlinear graph because of this binding. So what it means that if you are below a certain threshold of expression of the, of the antitoxin, so Imagine you express a lot of antitoxin and a small amount of toxin and they bind universally. So each new toxin that is made binds to the antitoxin and you have no free toxin in your cell. So the cell doesn't even know it's producing this toxin antitoxin. But as soon as you are close to the same production rate of toxin and antitoxin, this is very similar to zero order sensitivity. A very small fluctuation will create an, uh, 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 an amount of free toxin in the cell, and then you can arrest your cells from growing. So this nonlinear behavior, actually, to cut a very long story short, because I think 
that I want to get to the resistance, this story actually cuts. If you imagine that the total toxin concentration has some distribution, you know, just a normal distribution, what happens with this threshold is this distribution is cut between cells that are not going to be with free toxin at all, so their toxin level is, is zero, they're not going to be growth arrested, they'll grow happily, and cells that have a small amount of toxin above that toxin level, and they're going to be growth arrested. This is enough to predict, and uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Ophirbrian, to predict that in certain cases you can get a bimodal distribution of lag time, and if you, if you crank up the toxin level to higher levels, and this is something we could do just by taking this toxin mo antitoxin module apart and just controlling separately the level of toxin and antitoxin. So we control the, to the toxin production, we control the antitoxin production, and we can move through this uh, nonlinear threshold. And when we measure the lifetime distribution, we can see that we can move just by increasing the amount of toxin from a distribution that has a very narrow, no uh, lag time here, to a distribution that, that starts having a tail, and then eventually to a distribution that is shifted to much longer and broader lag time uh, distribution. So this is just by increasing the amount of toxin. Okay? So what we see here is what is crucial for this system is the balance between toxin and antitoxin, and just by affecting this balance, and this is probably what our mutation do, we can go from here to here, okay? And we can see that because the fluctuation in the amount of the, of the toxin are the crucial parameter for, for this distribution, this fluctuation are just Poisson in distribution of the amount of toxin, and therefore it's not a surprise that the variance and the mean are linked. So this, at least in this example, there are many more examples that we need to understand, but at least in the example of the mutation that we got repeatedly in this toxin-antitoxin module, we computationally really nail down why the distribution has to change to something like that and shifting it, finding the parameter that would shift the distribution to the true optimum is something that requires many more parameters to change and not just the level of the toxin. Okay, so I'll get to the last uh, to the last part of that someone asked before is what about resistance? But before before, if you have a question, yes. So actually, when we really model the stochastic process of expression, we assume just that it's a stochastic process that uh, uh, a, person, uh, a stochastic process of production. So the transcription is noisy. We did not put in any distribution by hand. We just assume a noisy so transcription, and this controls the distribution, yes, what's this, what's the distribution of like both or, or both both of the toxin and the antitoxin. We assume that all these processes are stochastic processes. Okay, so the distribution is not exactly a Gaussian. It's more, it's closer to a gamma distribution. Any other question on so far? Okay, so I was asked, how come you don't see resistance and what happens if you continue uh, with your experiment? So we were also surprised to see that in none of, uh, of, of the lines that we evolved, and there were about 20, we did not see resistance. And therefore we measured very precisely the probability to get a, uh, a resistant mutant. And when you put this number and multiply by the population size and the number of generation that we, that we get, at the end of the day, it just makes sense. It's very simple. The probability to get a mutant for the antibiotic that we used in our, for our population size and for our experimental setup is very low. And therefore, we did not see it. So no, no uh, mystery here. But what we wanted to know is, okay, this probability is very low because we work at very, very high antibiotic concentration, right? What happens if now we take the antibiotic concentration just by a factor of two down? It's still much above the MIC. It's still comparable, comparable to therapeutic dose. But now, when we put the numbers, we can see that the probability to get a resistant mutant is a, a probable event. What will win first? Resistance, tolerance, what's going to be the interplay between them? So we repeated the experiment. 
just by changing this parameter, but the experiment is the same. So we grow the cells overnight, dilute them in fresh medium in, with antibiotics, uh, uh, take all the survivors, wash the antibiotic, and let them grow again. Okay, so it's the same experiment. So what we see now is now it, the spread is, is higher between 8 to 17 cycles, and in some of the line we did not see a resistance, but now in most of the line we do, we, we do evolve resistance, right? So the data numbers do not lie, okay? Now we do evolve resistance. So we wanted to understand what was the trajectory? How did this population evolve resistance uh, to antibiotics? So first, just to convince you that now we have resistance, this is ancestral and this is the evolved strain, right? With this very simple test, you can also measure the MIC. The MIC between the ancestral and the evolved strain has changed between a factor of 10 and a factor of 20. So it's very high resistance, okay? Now, when we look now for for lines, and we, we did it for different uh, strains of bacteria just uh, to make sure that uh, it's uh, general. So you look at the MIC, you see that the MIC over, these are the cycles. I see that the cycle numbers are not here, but these are the cycles. So the MIC is uh, one, the MIC of the ancestral, and then it stays one for uh, many cycles. And then there is a sudden jump. There is a one mutation, so it's a step increase in the MIC. Not very surprising. Every time it's more or less a step increase. And here we measure really the evolved population on the fly. Now, of course, what we do is measuring lactone distribution. So we do, we do the same. In, we measure for each cycle the lactone distribution. As I showed you before, here to put all the cycles together, it's a box plot. So this, this is a narrow distribution, and this is a mean, and this is a wide distribution in the mean. Okay, so what you can see here is that much before resistance has jumped up, what happens first is that tolerance evolved. Okay, so mean that the lifetime distribution has shifted to again longer values and broader distribution. Okay, so each time within three or four cycle we can see some hints of tolerance, and the, tol the tolerance becomes uh, completely established much before the resistance appears. Okay, so the trajectory uh, uh, from uh, for evolving resistance. Maybe something like that. You start with the ancestral strain in blue here. You have a tolerant mutation because it's more probable, still more probable than a resistant mutation. This tolerant mutation spreads out. But eventually you'll get a resistant mutation and it will, because it's more fit than the tolerant mutation, it will spread in the population. Okay? That's one scenario. The other scenario is that you have a tolerant mutation that appears first and then the resistant population comes from this tolerant mutation population. Okay. So in order to distinguish between them, we did, did the whole genome sequencing of the batch culture. And, and wh what we see is that tolerant mutation appear. Several tolerant mutation can, uh, can appear the same in, in the same culture. And they spread and they, uh, and, and, and they are lost. But the resistant mutation are always coming from the tolerant mutation. So every time we see a resistant mutation, and what is nice about the antibiotics that we use is that the resistant mutation are very trivial. So it's ampicillin and the resistant mutation are in the promoter of the AMPC uh, gene, which is a resistant factor to ampicillin. Okay, so it's not surprising. All the mutations that we find are in the promoter region. So it's a very small target size. Okay, but each of these resistant strains, all of them have always a tolerant mutation accompanying them. And we can look at their lifetime distribution. So the, this is the lifetime distribution replotted to see the tail. So these are the, the, the number of cells that did not exit light. So we start with 100% of them at the lag phase. And then this, as they exit the lag phase, this number decreases. So this is the lifetime distribution of the evolved strain that is both tolerant. It has a, a, a long lifetime distribution and resistance. Now, if you take away the tolerance mutation, but it's still resistant, it goes back to the wild type distribution. The, and this is for each of the lines. So the lifetime distribution in each of the line can be very different. Here you can see that it's very long tail, but each time you, you take away the, t the mutation for tolerance that we identify as a tolerant, this lifetime distribution is gone. So that resistance, but, but the strain is still resistant, right? So resistance and tolerance are completely orthogonal phenotypes. So you have a mutation that makes you resistant and tolerant. I mean, two mutations 
resistance and tolerance, but if you take away the tolerant mutation, you are still resistant, okay? And each time we find a strain that is resistant, it has always uh, a tolerant mutation. And therefore, if you look at the trajectory, you start from the wild type, you never, just jump to a, you never jump directly to a resistant strain. You always go through the tolerant peak first, and then you evolve resistance. Okay. <coughs> so now it means that if we start from a tolerant strain, if we, we, we redo the, the whole evolution experiment, and now we start from a tolerant strain, okay? So now we, we started from two pairs of wild type and tolerant, so they differ just by one mutation. And what we saw is that each time, the tolerant strain evolved resistance faster than the non-tolerant strain. So tolerance is really a step stone to evolve resistance. Once you are tolerant, you are just one step away of evolving resistance. Yes? But if you know the concentration of the antibiotic, is it true or it can jump straight to the resistance? OK, actually, I don't have this paper. So we did this calculation because we can really understand completely what is the enhancement factor here. And actually, so if you lower the concentration to very low concentration, and then you increase the probability of a resistant mutant, then resistance will appear first, OK? But, but uh, if you are above what is called, I don't know, it's a technical term, but it's called the mutant prevention con concentration. This is the concentration that people want the antibiotics to reach in the clinic. It's a concentration for which a typical population size will not uh, have a mutation. Above this concentration, tolerance will always be win. Okay. Is it, uh, what is the lag time for the tolerance plus resistance? The, the lag time? Yeah, so in each in each line, it's slightly different. So it didn't because it became resistant. It didn't optimize its lag time. Okay, <coughs> this time, because uh, instead of but, but so here here the lag time is. Uh, is uh, about two hours, but here it's, here it's actually persistent. So you have, I didn't get into the difference between persistent tolerance, but persistence means just, just a fraction of the population is tolerant, okay? So here you can see that most of the population start exiting the lag time at the same time. But so somehow the growth but disadvantage is gone. No, the growth disadvantage is not gone. It's still, there. it's still there. If you take away this mutation, the growth disadvantage is gone, but the resistance is still there. Okay, this is what this graph is showing. Okay, so um, now we can very easily explain why tolerance is a stepping stone for resistance because the, what happens is that tolerance allows the resistance bacteria to survive much better than resistance alone. And therefore, once you become tolerant and you have even a partial resistant mutation, you are going to be resistant. And from partial resistance, we know that this, the, you can evolve full resistance very quickly. So it's a, a, an evolution trajectory that can occur in this high concentration that, peop, that is a holy grail for, for treatment. So the, all, all the antibiotics are moved to this very high concentration where resistance is not supposed to occur. But now we see that through the tolerant peak, actually, this resistance can occur even at these high concentrations, even when the bacteria are directly exposed to this high concentration and even without the gradual increase. Yes? What do you think if you have combined, if you have stress and then antibiotic resistance, do you think you can actually speed the tolerance or if you have any epidemic damage or... So if you have... Specific treatment that might affect maybe mutation by increasing, you can actually speed the tolerance that you know, maybe just the... So, for example, if you have an antibiotic that elevates the mutation rate, yes. Or if you have uh, treatment, uh, you need, I don't know. Yeah. Of no, of course, if you, el I mean. Or what is the rate of mutation? Yeah. Uh, so, if you elevate the general mutation rate, you elevate the mutation rate both for the tolerant and the resistance. So, you st st tolerance will still win. Be because they have a large target size. Well, what is so not, like not? I mean, there are some hotspots, but it, it looks as if the target size is higher. So if you elevate the mutation rate here, mu, you still keep the, the probability to evolve uh, tolerance much higher than the probability to evolve resistance. It's, 
if if the probability is equal now if you have uh, if 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 you do a treatment for example low antibiotic if you expose them to a low antibiotic concentration of the same antibiotic and then high then yes what you say uh, then they'll have they've all partial resistance in the low antibiotic concentration and then they won't go through tolerance yes So yes, we, we, uh, what, 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 what we see here is that wh what we see here is that two competing effects. If you are tolerant, then after the antibiotic treatment you have survived more, and now you do less, less generation until you recreate the whole population. So that's bad for you because you don't, if you divide less, your probability to have a big mutant pop population is lower. So being resistant is better. So there is a trade-off between resistance and tolerance, but in the high concentration and high uh, duration of treatment, which is supposedly uh, made to prevent resistance, what we see is that tolerance is, uh, is, uh, is doing the job. Okay, so I think my time is up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. <laughs> So what we saw is that, yes, the rapid evolution of the lifetime duration can really uh, create uh, 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 a population that evade the antibiotic treatment very efficiently. Um, and they do that by, uh, by, uh, by this extension of the lifetime that uh, uh, very nicely follows the treatment duration. Um, the viability increased beyond expectation. It was uh, believed to be a bad hedging, but when we do the biochemical analysis of one of these mutations in the toxin-antitoxin module, it looks as if it's how this co-evolution of the mean and the variance is just hardwired in the fluctuation of the proteins that needs to be taken into account. Um, we identified mutation, specific mutation responsible for tolerance together with uh, a large target size. Uh, so we can define what, what uh, we call the tolerance, so the tolerome, so the, the specific gene that when you mutate them, you get tolerance, and definitely toxin antitoxin uh, are there. We found one, but now we found another one. Never the one that we studied at the beginning. No, this one is not mutating, but <laughs> another one. Uh, and uh, what we see is that tolerance or persistence, it's a, more, it's a very similar phenomena. They promote the subsequent evolution of resistance, and you know, you can uh, speculate that maybe by having drugs that prevent tolerance, you may delay the evolution of resistance, and there are drugs that can kill non-growing bacteria, so maybe there is something to do there. And uh, more generally, monitoring the evolution of tolerance in the clinic may be important, because maybe strains that are highly tolerant are actually creating a disease, at least in some patients, that is more complex, and then you have to be very careful about the choice of antibiotics that you use on these uh, tolerant bacteria. But in the clinic, for the moment, you have absolutely no way of telling the difference. So, yeah? Um, regarding the medical aspect of the study, so if you want to prevent the tolerance, you waste time and power on the work. You want to make the bacteria grow faster. Right. But then it might be more viable. Right. Yes. No, it's, you know. I, you, you can have ideas and say, yeah, let's give them a boost of growth, but then, of course, it may be very, very dangerous. So, uh, actually, people have, uh, th there, there is one paper by the Collins group from uh, uh, the Bo Boston University, and they, they did an experiment on mice, and uh, they infected it with a tolerant strain, and, and then they, they gave the antibiotics together with glucose to boost the growth of uh, uh, and they, they claim that, yes, the antibiotics was more effective. If you culture for a longer time to uh, over, uh, get rid of the tolerance... In so, the yeah, if you... For, for this tolerance that is related to the lag, mm. right? You know, there are all other tolerant mechanisms out there, but for what we, we've shown here, yes, if you grow... If you maintain your culture truly exponential, mm. right, like Muno did, or if you grow them in a chemostat, Eventually, all these tolerant bacteria will go away. Yeah. Sorry, I think, okay. Last question. Okay. Sorry, I just 
your, your, your Michaelis Manton model doesn't explain the antibiotics relay experiment. That's it. You, you change the antibiotics. You put in the gyrus inhibitor. Your model wouldn't explain these results. What do you mean? Yeah, you, you put in antibiotics A and antibiotics B. You evolve the tolerant strain. Yes. With uh, an antistin or something. Yes. And later, put another inhibitor. Right. But this wouldn't be in. Though in, in our. By your antitoxin model. So the antitoxin model is just telling you independently of antibiotics, right, first. Independently, it's telling you how many cells are going to be gross arrested. How many cells are going to be f to have free toxin, and this free toxin arrests them, okay? So this is what the model tells you. Now, there are antibiotics that are going to kill even the arrested cells. I agree with you. The anti most of the antibiotics, the beta-lactam, the quinolone, are killing less effectively non-growing cells. So the toxin-antitoxin module predict how many non-growing cells we're going to have in the population, what is going to be the duration of gross arrest. And now the antibiotics, uh, the, the one that we show, are just not killing this gross arrested state, okay? So they are not in the model. The antibiotics are not in the model, okay? Thank you very much.